In the dead of winter, high in the velvet mountain wilderness of Croatia, a man and a wolf travel alone together. They go where no human would venture at this time of the year. The man's name is Paul Balenovic. His wolf is called Lick. They can be glimpsed at other times, framed high upon a distant ridge, or silhouetted on the edge of a hill at dusk. This is the story of a strange and wonderful friendship, and of how a man created a pack of wolves and released them into the wild. It would be a difficult story to believe if it wasn't true. The small Croatian town of Gracjats. Paul Balenovic first came here 17 years ago. It was a more peaceful time then, before the war in former Yugoslavia destroyed so many lives. Paul had come to buy a wolf cub. Lick, the wolf he bought, is old now, near the end of his life, and Paul is going back to the place where their remarkable friendship began. The town had changed, and I had difficulty remembering where I had bought Lick. The people selling the cubs had found a wolf's den. Lick was one of the six cubs. Why did I come back here? Perhaps I wanted to show Lick the place one last time. Perhaps I wanted to recall the memories of the wonderful things this creature gave me. I hoped it wouldn't be like this. The notice in the window said this is now a Croat house. I can only assume the family went because of the war. But here is where it all began, when I chose one of the cubs and named him Lick. I didn't know then how buying this wolf would change my life. From that day on, Paul kept a diary, and his movie camera never stopped turning. I returned to Zagreb with little Lick. He was less than a month old, and because I was worried about my parents' reaction, I had to hide him at first in my bedroom. I wanted to have a wolf because I was always interested in dogs. But I wanted to find out where they came from, what they really were, what the wild creature was, the wolf. I knew that wolves were special, because of the strength of their emotions. In the first two months, they make a lifelong bond to the family. But Lick was now on his own, and I could see he needed a companion. So we gave him Blue, a German shepherd puppy. It was so wonderful to see two such happy young animals playing together all day long. Like a young wolf cub in the wild, Lick was very good at hiding himself, so I put a bell on him to find him. 
Although she was only the same age as Lick, Blue soon recognized that she had to look after him. As they got older, their playfulness continued, but now Blue was trained to find Lick if he decided to hide. Paul's friend Vlasta took an interest in Lick and Blue from the very beginning. In those days I was studying to be a vet and it was fascinating for me to see wolves so closely. Uh, you know, there are many differences between wolves and dogs. For example, Lick always saved his strength. He had incredible stamina. He never got tired. It was a unique situation being able to compare a wolf and a dog together, and they carried out some rather unorthodox experiments. We measured how fast they could run. Blue ran 45 kilometers per hour and Lick once reached 75 kilometers. Paul's interest in Lick, however, went far beyond simple measurements. He was sensing something much deeper. Maybe I was born with this, I don't know, but I feel I have a special way with animals. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a vet, but what I'm always trying to do is to understand their minds. People often give me wild animals, which are sick. I take the time to get to know them. There is a universal language for all animals, I believe. You have to understand how they see you to communicate. The most important thing is fear of being caught. When you approach any animal, you must respect the distance between you and it and keep in mind its need to have room to escape. If you get this wrong, then you will cause the animal to attack you. If you get it right, you can gain trust. As Lick and Blue got older, Paul, Vlasta and friends escaped from Zagreb and headed for Croatia's remote Velebit Mountains, which stretch along the Adriatic coast. The Velebits are perfect wolf habitat, but it was a place where wolves had been hunted to extinction. There, Paul saw how Lick's wild instincts were beginning to assert themselves. It was funny when we went to the small lake. Lick never wanted to enter the water. But whenever Blue went out from the water, he attacked, just in the moment when she was not able to defend. This was the time when Lick showed that he is really a small wolf. He knew that this was when normally the wolf would be able to attack the prey. The differences between Lick the wolf and Blue the dog began to widen. A bit later there was another incident, when he started hunting some bullocks. After spotting him, the bullocks were suspicious and moved forward menacingly. Lick immediately responded by rolling in the dung to mask his smell. He was determined to continue his attack. Blue saw this and sensed he was going to do something bad, something I wouldn't allow. She chased after him, trying to stop him, barking, trying to get him back. I realized how different Lick and Blue had become. Although at first it looked like both were hunting, there was a difference. Blue was in fact doing what a dog would do, guard a territory from an attacker, while Lick, he was hunting. Soon Blue gave up, but Lick continued checking each animal one by one, splitting them up to find the weakest. The last one he challenged head to head, I knew the next time he was thinking, you will be my prey. It 
It was increasingly clear to Paul that the capital city Zagreb was not the place for Lick. So he went more and more to the Velibet Mountains, often staying for weeks in the wilderness. It was a time when he began to understand the life of the wolf. Lick led him, he followed and watched and learned. As Lick got older, he became wilder. Paul needed to keep him away from people because he could be dangerous. To avoid that risk, they went to deep and remote places. Lick had now become very powerful and took over as leader, even forcing Paul to follow him. Lick saw that I got lost in the forest and began stopping. He still does it today. He wanted to show me the way in the mountains, his own wolf's way, not by human tracks. Sometimes when there was a danger, for example, when there was a bear around, he noticed I couldn't sense it. He couldn't understand how I wasn't aware of the danger. He would beg me to move or might even force me by threatening to attack. But Paul went on going deeper and deeper into the mountains and at different times of the year. If you really want to see the wolf, you have to see him in the winter. Wolves are at their most magnificent and powerful because it is the time when they mate. Males know that females are coming into heat by checking the smell at marking points. In fact, this strong sexual calling is another reason why Lee can be dangerous to me. He can see me as a potential rival. Winter in the Velibet Mountains is very severe. Storms can last for days, even weeks. Paul's regard for the creatures which could survive here deepened, particularly his wolf. Lick is my guide, my leader, as well as my protector. He's like my map. He always knows the way home, so I've come to trust him. Now, I chain myself to him, not him to me, not to get lost. He saved my life many times over. My connection with Lick has enabled me to visit new areas, new territories, at a time of year when there is nobody else in the mountains. I have respect for this incredible creature. I thank him for allowing me to be here and enjoy the frozen wind. To see the wilderness where he truly belongs is the gift he has given to me. Over the years, Paul became more and more withdrawn. Um, he would go more and more alone with Lick to the mountains. And I think, I think he didn't need other people. Lick was the best company for him. I felt myself changing because of the wolf. Running, always running in the darkness of the forest, pretending I wasn't afraid of the dark and unknown. Trying to be his equal. The silence between us pushing me to cross over and think like a wolf. It was like a dream, moving and moving after this silent force. Now, in my mind, I see the wolf 
at the deepest part of the forest. The wolf merging with the darkness, not able to be seen unless it allows you to. It was easy for me to spend time in the mountains with Lick because of my job. In those days, I was a movie stuntman. Many movies were shot in Yugoslavia, and I worked doing car and horse stunts on films like War and Remembrance and The Dirty Dozen. I'd only once ever allowed Lick to be used in the movies. It was for a friend. I doubled as an actor and provoked Lick into an attack on me. But I never thought such an attack could happen for real. On the day it happened, I'd been doing a stunt on the Dirty Dozen and in the evening playing my banjo on Croatian television. That night I walked Lick and Blue by the river in Zagreb. That was when I made my big mistake. Blue jumped on me with muddy paws and I hit her to push her away. Lick saw this and thought he too would be attacked, but I was holding him on too short a chain. It stopped him getting away, so he attacked me. Paul and Lick were a sort of rivals. Who is the first, who is the strongest, who is leader? But this attack changed something between them. Paul knew he could easily have been killed, such was the ferocity of Lick's attack. Paul was bitten and had an arm and leg crushed. I'd broken one of my rules of being with animals. Lick had been scared, but had no room to escape. Me, I couldn't let him go and have a wolf loose in the city. There was nothing left but for him to attack me. For a whole year, their relationship broke down. Lick ceased communication, and it was impossible for Paul to even approach his compound. All Paul could do now was wait. Then he made a decision that was to affect the rest of his life. For he now realized that Lick had to be released back into the wild. It was the right place for him. But how could he do it? I couldn't simply let him free on his own. He might be dangerous to people, might not even survive. Then I worked out how to do it. I needed to find him a mate and get them to breed. If Lick could feel a strong responsibility to her and the cubs, he would have a chance. Because a female with cubs would instinctively know how to survive in the wild. It was a miracle that Paul managed to find a young, wild female wolf. But it happened. He caught her when he was near Sarajevo, working on one movie. My job was looking after a horse. Quite easy, so I had the time to explore. It was very interesting territory different from my mountain. The shepherds there told me wolves were around. They showed me a sheep recently killed during a wolf attack.
That evening I went out. A small shadow on the horizon surprised me. I chased it and caught it. It was only then I realized it was a wolf cub. Paul returned to Zagreb astonished at his luck. And the cub was female. He called her Lacha. From the first moment, it was clear that Lick accepted her. I knew he wouldn't be jealous. It wasn't in his character. He started licking her. And it was obvious that he wanted to look after her, almost like a father. And she understood this. When I saw them together, I wondered whether she was going to end up a daughter rather than his mate. But whether daughter or mate, it was clear that Lick is older. His status has to be respected. You could see him showing his authority of a lacha, especially over food. Lacha also respected Blue, the German shepherd, who once again took on her role as the go-between. It was a family of strange, of amazing relationships. Lacha was um, timid and gentle, and everything was quite different and much easier than with Lick. In that time, Paul had a lot of experience with wild wolves, and um, Lacha and Paul were never rivals. Lick would simply look at me. And it was also interesting to watch how different hair reactions were to blues. Lacha could sense the bear much, much earlier. These were really happy times. But I was worried about her lack of fear. She needed to have certain fears if I was to release her back into the wild. What I was especially worried about were hunters. They set traps for wolves in the forest, and I had to show these to Lacha. I made some traps which I weakened. I put her in them. It was quite enough to make her scared. In the autumn of 1991, Yugoslavia descended into war. Paul volunteered to defend Croatia. He was sent to the front line to command a poorly equipped unit against the might of the Yugoslav army and Serb forces which had occupied his country. Paul had to put on hold his plans for Lick and Lacha. We were holding a position in a bottled water factory. The front line was along the river Kupa, south of Zagreb. A bridge separated us and both sides fired on each other all day long. War isn't like it is in the movies. You get no warning of death. You don't even know where it's coming from. One time a rocket went past my head. I'd be dead now if it had detonated.
I remember the new year 1992. I invited Paul and his family to my house just to celebrate that we are alive and we wanted Paul to play banjo but only thing he could do was to talk about the war. I think the images of what he had seen haunted him all the time. He couldn't do anything to save his people and many very young fellows died and that shocked him. That winter, while Croatia was still at war, Lik and Lacha had created life. It was the 22nd of May 1992 when the cops were born. Paul was so excited. It's very interesting to see Lik as a father. Uh, he was so gentle, so careful. I read in books about how close wolf families are, how strong the bonding is. But it was wonderful to see it in front of my own eyes. Watching him playing with the cups, I felt now he had a good chance to transfer his affection from me onto his new family. And this would be his best chance to get back to the wild with them. but especially moving was to see how he paid the greatest attention to one of the cubs who had got sick. When the cubs were born, Paul had absolutely no money. He'd lost his job because of war and he needed money to release wolves back to the nature. So he decided to sell one cup. It was white sock. I tried not to get too close to the cubs. I wanted them to be as wild as possible. But there was one I really liked, because he was so similar to Lick. He had a white forepaw, so I called him White Sock. I had a friend from Slovenia, who I believed had the same interest in wolves as me. He came to buy one of the cubs and chose White Sock. I let him have White Sock, because if he was anything like Lick, he would be the best of the cubs to be with people. Paul really had no choice and he was upset. After he sold White Sock, he telephoned me and said shortly, I did it. I felt very guilty. I went to Lick and Lacha. Lick positioned himself between Lacha and me because Lachin could even attack me. And Lick didn't want this. To express his deepest emotion, he offered me his paw. He understood what had happened. Lick's lifelong friend, Blue the German Shepherd, died soon after the cubs were born. But time was pressing in on Paul, and he knew his wolf family needed to be released soon. 
The cubs were growing up quickly, now nearly two months old, and the older they got, the more difficult it would be for them to adjust to the wild. But where in the mountains could he put them? Paul couldn't make up his mind. I had to work out where to release them, where they would be safe. The place originally planned had been mined by the war. I searched map after map. I was crying when I went to say goodbye to Wick. I thought I'd never see him again. Paul was also upset. He was giving away what was really his family. The drive to the mountain that night was the longest drive of my life. The war, the whole situation, was not how I planned it. On top of all the emotions I was feeling, I felt there was danger all around. I felt hunted myself. I held one of the cubs in my arms that night and prayed that I could find somewhere safe for them. Just before sunrise it came to me, a place which was nothing, a place where everybody passes by, but a place where I could always help them. We drove down and I released them. I watched Lacha and the cubs going off into the trees. The wind was blowing and I was glad that it would cover up the whining of the cubs. It was clear that Lick was uncertain about what was going on. But Lacha knew what she had to do. She had to go and find a place that was safe for the cubs. After they had gone, I busied myself with practical details. I kept filming everything to keep my emotions away. I found some places where I could leave the water. Then it was important that I hide all the evidence of our presence here. More than anything, I was worried because hunters were allowed to shoot wolves. I even covered up the tracks of my Land Rover. And finally, I left my jacket as a sign for them that I would come back. The wolves had gone, and I felt myself terribly alone. I was glad that they were free in the wild, but I wondered whether I would ever be able to see them again. I left the sick female cub behind when I went to the mountains, but in the meantime she had died. A few weeks later, I returned to the place where I released them. I was very surprised when Lick arrived, and very happy that when he came he was holding my jacket. He too was happy, but he was also submissive and angry, all at the same time. It looked like he was asking for something. I offered him water, but he didn't want it. 
I wondered whether his health was okay. I tried to follow him away from our meeting point to find out, but he made it clear he didn't want this. I realized that he was now protecting the cubs and felt this was a good sign. Lacha, meanwhile, was getting wilder and wilder. But Paul was concerned about whether she'd be able to hunt. Although I wrote in my diary that it was good she'd come to eat the meat I'd brought, I wanted her to start finding her own food. The next evening, I saw it happen. She caught a grasshopper. Only a small prey, but I was very glad. Soon after, she took something much larger proper wolf food, a rabbit. Satisfied the signs were good that his wolf family was adjusting to the wild, Paul returned to his human brood to get on with the rest of his life. It was another month or so before he visited the Velibet Mountains again. But this time there was to be a worrying development. I was astonished when I found Lick and Lacha out in the open on an exposed mountain road. I knew something was wrong and I'd never seen Lacha begging Lick like this. A kilometer or so away, I found the cubs too were on the road. In fact, the entire family was on the move and they were in great danger. I continued down to our meeting point, hoping that they would follow me. When I got there, Lick was already waiting for me. It was clear to me that Lick's actions were causing all of this. I offered him my hand carefully as he came towards me. I sensed that he wanted to enter the Land Rover. I wondered whether this was what Lacha was begging him not to do. I could see that he was angry. On his next trip to the mountains, Lick came back to Paul. It was clear that the bonding between them was just too strong. I didn't want to take him, but I had to. I knew he wouldn't stop looking for me and was getting too close to people. He even came to a house on the edge of the mountain to find me. I drove back to Zagreb knowing that my wolf family now no longer had its father. I suppose you could say I must have failed to get Lick back to the world, but it was his decision to come back to me. At night, he howled a distant, sorrowful howl. Lick. He howled because he was trying to call our family to be together. And what had become of that family? I dreaded to think. I think Lacha was uh, confused after Lik disappeared. She went to the mountain house and some people were there. They fed her and they treated her like a dog. She reacted like a wolf and beat one teenage girl on the leg. It wasn't a real attack. She was just testing people, not threatening them. And when hunters heard about that, they shot her. I'd always thought of shooting Lacha with a paper bullet to make her frightened of hunters. 
I never imagined that it would happen for real. But it did. I found a place where she'd been hit. I followed her trail of blood. Eventually, I found a place where she had lain. Then, I lost her trail. For 16 days, Paul searched the mountains for Lacha, not knowing if she was dead or alive. Lacha! On the top of a rock which looked out high over the meeting point, Paul found a place where she had lain and signs that she might still be alive. I knew the blood was old, but next to it was something completely different to normal. Her droppings contained a type of moss. Maybe she'd eaten it as a special medicine. What was more, Paul remembered that this kind of moss was only found lower down on the mountain, near the meeting point. I came down and began checking around nearby, their water bowl and meat I'd left some time before. When I returned to the Land Rover, I saw to my amazement that she'd left a sign. Now, I knew that she was still alive. That evening, I brought Lick. I got him to howl for her. I hoped that this would make her come out so that I could see what had happened. In the grey light of the next morning, she arrived to be with Lick. At first, I couldn't see the extent of her injuries. Then, as she moved to one side, I began to make out that she had a seriously damaged foreleg. As she limped up the hill towards me, I just couldn't understand how somebody could hurt a creature who had given me such joy. I gave her food to help her survive. After the latch was shot, I don't think Paul ever expected to see cops again. He still went with Lick to the meeting point. But it had been a long time since he had seen them. Then something incredible happened. One night, Paul was sleeping in the Land Rover and by accident, he touched the light switch. To my amazement, I saw the cubs all around Lick. They'd come to see their father. It looked like they'd been there for quite a long time. But I couldn't believe what they did next. Come back in full daylight.
It was wonderful for all the family to be together again. And Lake obliged by giving the cubs lunch. As they got older, they kept on coming back. Ljubljana, the capital of Slovenia, autumn 1997. It's now 17 years since Paul first met Lik. Paul has travelled across into neighbouring Slovenia to deal with one last piece of unfinished business. Lik's cub White Sock, who Paul was forced to sell during the war, has ended up in Ljubljana Zoo. But the zoo is allowing him to have White Sock back because Paul has a plan. His plan is to eventually release White Sock. Paul knows he's going to have to start all over again, preparing another wolf for the wild. I'm glad that Lacha and the cubs are still living out in the wild. Occasionally, I see her. And I know that they all follow my tracks. I'm happy that I gave the mountain something back. And Lick, in some ways, he paid for this. Did I do the right thing? If I hadn't taken him, in the beginning, he probably wouldn't have lived long. And our friendship was always honest and true, even though I'm a human being and he is a wolf. On the 6th of January, 1998, Lick died. Paul buried him in the Velibet Mountains. <laughs> 